Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, welcome to our third online workshop, which is run by the Health for Policy, Policing and Race Project here at SOAS. Um, today we're discussing police repression beyond the United States. And what this workshop is really is, um, it's an attempt to recalibrate a discussion that's monopolized by voices in the US, framings from the US, um, because it's been more than two years since we missed really an unprecedented and international wave of dissent against violent systems of policing in the wake of George Floyd's public execution. Um, his death became a symbol uh, for racial oppression in systems of policing around the world. Uh, but despite the truly global scope of these protests, the conversation um, he has uh, shrunk back um, to the site of Floyd's death, you know, to the protest center of the United States. And so this is a discussion that discusses the existence of marginalized communities elsewhere, whether that's police violence that people experience or police violence that uh, they collectively risk. So today, what we'll try and do is uncover the varying realities of these violence across the globe. And this isn't to downplay nor the scale of police violence in the US, but it's to see how these police returns um, in the United States are intimately connected to those elsewhere in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and you know, staying on the theme of the project uh, as a whole, we'll try and see how a lot of this connection is tied to global legacy, colonialism, and enslavement. Because only by making uh, an honest diagnosis about the global colonialities of the same can we ask what it means to rebuild transcontinental solidarity existence. And I'm delighted to be joined by four uh, wonderful speakers today. Um, Shailza Sharma, who is a visiting lecturer um, at Western Law School and a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, and also editor of Attention Solidarity. Um, a lawyer by training, Shailza's academic research lies at the intersection of gender and women's rights, legal theory, social movements, and contemporary Indian politics. Sami Adadu is a doctoral student at uh, the Middle East and South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University and co-founder of Detention Society Network. Her research combines cultural studies, gender and sexuality, particularly in the context of South Asia. Rini Duala is a human rights, human rights advocate, influencer and community organizer focused primarily on issues of pity, justice, humanity and community advancement. Uh, a prominent figure during the NSARS protest, she's currently the executive project director at Connect Hub NG, a platform that campaigns against state violence and police brutality in Nigeria. And finally, we've got Leandro Milanari, who is a criminologist working at Stockholm University in Sweden. Uh, in 2020, he defended his dissertation, Race and Order, Critical Perspectives on Crime in Sweden, where he, among other things, explores matters of racial profiling. Unmining problems with over policing and under protection among racialized communities in the North realm advances an anti racist research agenda to diagnose problems with state sanctioned violence. So each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes before opening up to uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to try and be a strict chair. So if you see my face popping up, that's an awkward way of saying maybe wrap up in the next few minutes. Um, and I'm going to invite Shilta and um, Samia to speak first, and I'm going to try and share my screen as they do it. So. Let's so do I put that works. Okay. All right, I think we can get started. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, for organizing this and really excited to be in conversation uh, with all of you. Um, I think we would like to first begin by acknowledging that for a lot of people who are familiar with the context of India um, are likely to know some of what we're raising. Um, and we are really indebted to their work um, to be able to make a narrative like this about uh, what policing in India looks like. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that to start. Um, and we uh, are hoping through this presentation to raise uh, some of the cases and points that can give us a broad overview of the kinds of 
uh, violence and discrimination and harassment that make up the everyday of policing practices in India and give us a specific insight into the overall mechanisms and logics of policing. Um, Shilza, do you want to go for the, the talk about the next part? Sure. Um, second. Um, so we'll begin our presentation by uh, centering cases and points uh, that give us a broad overview of the kinds of violence and discrimination and harassment uh, that make up everyday policing practices in India. Um, in, in, in the next section, we will move on to focus on the farmers protests that took place in 2020 in North India and the primarily uh, taking place in North India and the research efforts that we at Attention Solidarity uh, undertook uh, at that point uh, that were spurred to kind of support the movement. And we'll end by thinking with you on why it is not only important, but uh, essential and constructive to look into the global south uh, when building power against the carceral state. Oliver, if you could, yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll start with uh, setting the context with colonial policing, um, the modern law and order apparatus that developed under British colonial rule relied heavily on their Orientalist knowledge of the subcontinent. And this is very much reflected and uh, co-constituted with policing practices in the region. Um, so the idea that the subcontinent could be understood through caste and religion served to solidify pre-existing practices. For instance, the forms of dominant, dominant caste control and punitive practices that already existed in communities uh, used by dominant castes against uh, oppressed caste groups. Um, while the British saw them as things that needed to change and uh, for the native population to be civilized, um, a lot of these practices were also adopted in different forms and made part of the policing practices that were instituted. Um, and one uh, important development in this period was the use of force through lati charge, lati meaning baton. Um, and the use of torture. Uh, these were justified particularly on the basis of the unique despotic context of the country. Um, and then finally, um, policing centrally involved the suppression of the native population social organizing, and it framed any possibility of political emancipation as criminal at worst and suspect at best. Um, so what you see in the slide is a little picture of um, a massacre that took place in April 1919, which is uh, fairly well known. Um, and th this is actually a picture of protesters pointing to bullet marks um, uh, to, uh, make, to re remind us of exactly the kinds of harm that took place in the area. Next slide. So uh, while some of the social movements like Jalian Alabag and uh, political leaders have become central to the nationalist narrative after independence, um, there are tactics of state repression that continue in independent in India that look quite similar to the colonial setup, um, but many of them have also been strengthened and changed through their legal apparatus. So, uh, for instance, in the context of protests, we find the police indiscriminate, indiscriminately used tear gas. And uh, the image you see here is from the farmers' protest, which we'll be discussing more later. Um, like I mentioned, the use of the lati or baton is very, very common in protests. The image here is from 1993. Um, that's pretty consistent in Indian history. Um, and there is also, during protests, a lot of targeting and arresting of specific protesters that takes place um, all across. Um, other than that, there is uh, public knowledge that police across the country uh, carry out extrajudicial killings, which are locally known as encounters. Um, so people are rounded up and killed, and it is later claimed that these targeted murders were done in self-defense. Um, and this is fairly public, like public knowledge um, that encounters are, are done very routinely. Um, and similarly with torture and custodial killings, um, these are also open secret uh, and open secret, and there are a high number of them that continue to take place. Um, I've shared two pictures here from uh, protest, first from the protests that took place against the Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens uh, in 2019. 
Um, here, there was a lot of arbitrary arrest um, off, uh, amongst the massive protests. And uh, the police were also involved in pogroms that took place against Muslims in various parts of Delhi in the aftermath. Um, the anti-CAA protests, as they're commonly known, also saw community members being emboldened with weapons in a program called Police Mitra or Police's Friends, where they basically served to snitch on people and were actively involved in violence and burning homes and vehicles. Um, since then, a lot of these everyday practices of policing um, through, through the pandemic, a lot of them were heightened and used against migrants and day laborers. Um, the picture you see here is of Jairaj, a 59-year-old uh, man, and his son, Benix, uh, who was 31 years old. And they were arrested in Tamil Nadu um, on the basis of having their mobile ac accessory shop open after hours. Um, during the COVID lockdown, um, and, it, and the police uh, sexually assaulted and tortured the two men to death. Um, and this uh, sparked a lot of outrage, um, bringing back recognition of the kinds of um, the persistence of custodial violence and custodial death um, in the country. Uh, next slide. I think that um, so so what we've shared so far are some of these common like everyday policing practices. And I think that um, other others from the global south and I mean I think from the global north as well would have would share that experience of seeing the police uh, carry out these kinds of brutalities um, using other names or whatever it is but but similarly carrying out very similar practices but one of the things that is particular I think in the subcontinent um, is is the is the the punitive practices of caste that are taking place alongside and along with and within uh, the policing system. Um, and so the, these everyday policing practices for one are particularly felt by those from oppressed caste communities known as Dalits, uh, tribal communities known as Adivasis, uh, along with religious minorities, sex workers, beggars, and those in poverty who continue to be harassed and arrested and face violence with a lot of impunity. And you can see here that this is kind of happening on the basis of very similar moral codes that motivated the British civilizing mission. Um, and then uh, I think that the other part of policing that in India that is essential to understand is the level and form of punitive violence that is very casteist at its core. And an example here that I was keen to share was of the Kerlanji uh, case. Um, this was a case that happened in 2006 where a dominant caste mob uh, dragged out uh, a woman and her two children um, who had made a, com a police complaint for their land rights. And the mob uh, paraded them naked, raped and lynched them to death. Um, and then the local police shielded the alleged perpetrators in the investigation. And ultimately, while some people were charged, um, there was no recognition of caste violence and the fact that this was very directly a form of violence that took that that is uh, marked with casteism. So um, you can see that uh, justice looks very different uh, for people from oppressed caste communities and the police not only aids and abets this violence, but also has its own techniques to preserve uh, those caste hierarchies. Uh, Anti-caste activists have long uh, looked to the constitution of India, which created provisions against caste atrocities. Um, but we, we find that consistently the police fail to record complaints uh, and maintain caste hierarchies in the investigation and at the judicial stage. So the other example I was keen to share is from 2020, uh, which is uh, from the district of Hatras in Uttar Pradesh where a 19-year-old Dalit girl was uh, gang raped by upper caste men. Um, and after hearing her, her mother took her to the police station They and the police did not file a complaint. They kept rejecting her claims and humiliated the people. Um, and then the police finally registered a complaint and they were able to record a victim statement. And then uh, she died from her injuries. Um, and afterwards there was a forced cremation that took place where um, the police did not allow the family members to even be there. So uh, this kind of complicates the picture of, um, uh, this kind of shows and kind of complicates the picture of, of what 
um, justice looks like uh, in, in the Indian context, where you can see that the police are very much involved in its obstruction and in access um, for specific communities. Um, next slide, please. The, the uh, points I just wanna um, make here are that the, the other um, specificity of policing in India uh, is, is also the kinds of policing that happens in uh, certain regions across the country where there is, uh, which are considered like the regions of armed conflict. Um, and here you see there being um, a range of different kinds of um, a spectrum of uh, forces that are in place. So there's police, but there's also paramilitary forces. There's a police controlled by the central government and the military. And a lot of them operate um, with impunity. And the Armed Special Forces Act is the symbol of that impunity um, that has allowed for there to be um, mass killings of people in the regions, um, a lot of people being arrested on the premise that they're insurgent or separatist. Um, and it's important to note that a lot of these regions are uh, of uh, indigenous persons or Adivasi persons as they're known, um, like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, as well as Northeast Kashmir um, and religious minorities like Sikhs. So the police uh, tend to collude with a lot of uh, the local organizations um, and uh, that has, that has uh, led to a lot more of the similar kinds of everyday policing that you see quite heightened in, uh, in these regions. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, here I just wanted to point to some of the newer techniques that, of policing that we're seeing. So um, there is a move uh, towards modernizing and uh, as always a persistent effort towards development, which has involved digitizing and digitizing has brought with it a heightened form of surveillance in the country. Um, you can, uh, so for example, there, what you see on the left side is, is um, the records of some uh, folks are, who are labeled history sheeters. So they're listed down as people who have a criminal history a lot of those records are now being um, digitized and that actually kind of makes them more permanent sources of knowledge that allow for the continued harassment of certain populations. Um, and in protest uh, time also, that what you can see on the right is the ways in which a lot of the imagery here in this image, it's a, for the same anti-citizenship uh, uh, amendment act protest. Those images are actively used to kind of target uh, specific protesters and go after them. So um, these are some of the new forms. Uh, next slide. Um, and the other thing that we've been seeing, particularly this year, is uh, the use of evictions and bulldozers. Um, the police have been involved in uh, evicting people in Assam in September last year. Uh, we saw that uh, Bengali Muslims' homes were um, uh, you know, burned down. There was again uh, similar kinds of use of uh, tear gas and use of um, uh, open bullets. There was there were casualties, um, and more recently this year, um, a lot of Muslim homes have been uh, demolished um, by the police uh, on the premise that they were illegal. And a lot of the people whose homes have been uh, demolished have also been activists and who are actively involved in um, some of the uh, on on. Um, making clear the amount of harm that Muslims in the country are currently facing. So these are some of the newer forms of uh, policing that we are seeing uh, in India. Um, so I think that the point of our of uh, my overview, this very fast overview of the the uh, kind of key cases of policing that we're seeing is to uh, key cases of uh, police violence and brutality is to point out that there are likely to be a lot of similarities with the forms of policing that, that one might see across the world. And at the same time, there are certain unique histories of caste and religion um, that uh, are, require some reckoning and also tell us something more about how policing globally functions. Okay, so I'm just going to continue from where Soumya left and uh, we, I can go into some of the uh, data that we kind of uh, collected 
uh, when the farmers struggle happened in started in 2020. Um, so just to give an overview, uh, yeah, just one slide before. Yeah, so uh, primarily uh, centered in North India and Punjab, in the states of Punjab and Haryana, uh, farmers unions gathered to protest in, in this mid 2020 July onwards to um, kind of protest three laws that were passed, draft laws that was that were passed by this government. They aimed to, I think uh, it's not relevant for us to actually go into what the laws were trying to do, but uh, primarily uh, they, the major critique of the laws by these farmers and farm unions was that they were detrimental uh, to agriculture and they were unconstitutional in their promulgation and they allowed uh, unregulated entry of uh, monopoly or uh, big corporations. Uh, so this was a huge protest uh, spanned for more than 15 to 16 months. Um, and the, how it looked was that, you know, there was at the beginning of the protest, there was a uh, next slide, please. Uh, there was um, mobilization within the local and state uh, regions of Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh. You see some of the maps uh, marking those states in orange at the top there. And uh, from June on, June, July onwards, this kind of moved and escalated when, uh, without hearing the farm unions and, and farmers, the uh, law, uh, the, uh, the ordinance uh, was made into law in September 20th, uh, September 2020. And uh, this led to kind of escalation of the resistance to various methods by uh, unions, which was, you know, the, and these are also very usual methods of large scale mobilization and protests that are common to kind of the subcontinent, I would say. So there were, you know, stopping of the rail uh, to affect government services. Uh, there was, you know, all India shutdown called by trade unions and farmer unions, uh, nationwide roadblocks, uh, which are planned and announced in advance and other kinds of spontaneous protests in different regions uh, supported all over, all over India. So, uh, I mean, to then further negotiate, start a negotiation with the government, a, you know, a coalition of farmer unions also was formed in November. Some of the talks started in October, they failed, and uh, the farmers decided to kind of uh, shift their protest location to the national capital in Delhi and uh, surround the national capital on various borders to actually uh, you know, tell the government that they're they're not going to relent unless their demands are met. Uh, next slide, please. So this was somewhere in November 2020. They uh, started from their various location locations in two major states of Haryana and Punjab, and faced about four to five days of extreme repression. As you can see on the left. Uh, you'll see, you know, the kind of borders, like the kind of uh, mechanisms that the police use. So it's like proper, um, uh, you know, barricades, uh, chains, uh, cemented roads with nails, uh, which were actually propped up right before, right, you know, uh, to stop the farmers from even entering the national capital uh, region. And uh, at each of these, you know, obviously it was... Oh, at, uh, they were manned in such ways that there were huge highway trucks also blocking uh, the road when farmers were trying to actually reach the capital. And obviously there was uh, violence, uh, lati charge, uh, water cannon, tear gas, which have now become a common kind of uh, repressive tactic within uh, social movement or protest gatherings uh, in India, I think, and across the world. So, uh, yeah, so this is some of the image representation of that. Um, yeah, so next slide, slide, please. So we at Detention Solidarity, along with some of the journalists and lawyers, activists, kind of gathered uh, data, particularly around how the police acted during the span of 15 to 16 months. Uh, for and the reasons that we kind of uh, you know are among uh, activists kind of decided that that this was important was to kind of we understand that within social movements there is already the state is systematically collecting uh, data monitoring activists and obviously surveilling and they have the sophisticated tools to keep doing that uh, and actually you know keep doing that until the activists are tired. 
so, so in order to kind of preserve public memory of states' atrocities, excesses, and the, the routine violence, it was important for us to actually mark those events where we know that um, you know state and state apparatus, in, including the police, have acted in particularly uh, brutal ways. So the other kind of uh, administrative purpose of doing this was to form and aid in you know formation of legal aid committees and uh, you know provide legal defense. Uh, other important thing was to obviously cross verify any information that the government is kind of releasing in terms of how many cases they have lodged, uh, what kind of brutality has happened, what action the police has taken. Uh, the other was forming pressure groups and countering state and media propaganda, because at the end of the day, even within India, the media houses that were talking and discussing about the farmers protests are big, are owned by big uh, corporations. And so they were kind of, um, you know, so holding them accountable and also uh, countering their propaganda was an important uh, uh, aspect of doing this exercise. And finally, I think it was also important for us to understand how state authorities actually interact with social movements, what kind of fear tactics uh, are created and are used. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, one among the biggest among them through social media, through uh, media houses and through state propaganda was actually how easy it is for state. And we saw with, uh, I think, BLM protests as well, uh, the mischaracterization of uh, protest groups and labeling them as, you know, extremists or uh, refuting even allegations of inciting violence. Um, so, I mean, in the Indian context, although I do want to see that this exercise is, is actually not new, uh, it, is, it is within the civil and democratic rights or, uh, you know, tradition and history of civil liberties movement in India that uh, many organizations have actually carried the burden of archiving some of uh, this information at different points in different social movements for many decades. But I think what is different for us now is that since 2014, since coming of the, you know, BJP fascist whatever government in power, a, a, a Brahminical Hindutva kind of fascism, it is important for us to acknowledge that such organizations and, uh, you know, democratic rights organizations have faced relentless, relentless uh, repression and silencing, which has actually made it difficult for them to operate uh, within this kind of fear and atmosphere of fear. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our method, uh, so briefly go into the method. I think we uh, we used uh, news and media reports, legal documents, testimonies, and social media aggregation to kind of uh, look at all of this uh, data. Uh, because importantly, because most of the data on uh, repression, how much injury, et cetera, is not usually reported in the newspapers. It is through Twitter and social media accounts that we were able to collect uh, actual videos and uh, testimonies of people as well in terms of how much injury was caused through these very public acts of violence. Um, I think over 16 months of data uh, has shown us that there were 70 separate incidents which took place um, uh, uh, took place uh, where uh, you know the police interacted with the general public and uh, next slide please. And they used one or a combination of these methods that are listed in the table here, which have now become like a common uh, uh, kind of. Uh, and there were there are of course uh, differences in in uh, it, uh, this data has been also helpful, and we are, it's kind of work in progress, and it will I think be also helpful to kind of compare it with other social movements in the past. So some of these tactics, uh, like forcible removal of people from protest site, preventive detention, huge number of false FIRs, and even by uh, you know government's own claim, there are some 130 FIRs being complaints registered in the police station uh, first information reports through which legal cases are then uh, taken up. So uh, as as many as 136 FIRs have been lodged in one state where more than 12,000 people have been named or have been uh, kind of implicated in cases. And most of these cases, as we are going along, looking at these data are false, exaggerated FIRs with 
overcharging of criminal uh, and penal provisions to ensure that you know uh, people are bound to appear in court are are you know a, a huge burden of legal costs is uh, implied on them. So I think some of these um, uh, things that are also important to um, remember because. Uh, as I was saying, in terms of significance, uh, the moment uh, you know social media, media, and kind of people's attention moves away from social movements, it, it becomes difficult for uh, the repression that the state has the mechanism to continue to actually uh, kind of uh, take an accountability check for. So this kind of exercise, which shows us these are the moments when the police acted in in particularly violent ways. Uh, uh, it is on ground important for lawyers to actually have that information and say counter that I know actually it is there, there was no cases of injury against the police officers on ground. So, um, I mean, as I said, this is kind of a work in progress for us, but uh, this is some of the things that we have been able to kind of consolidate in terms of uh, police uh, violence and police action in the, in the protests in the farmers movement. So yeah, I think I will close that part of uh, the, and quickly just say a line about uh, what we tried to discuss today. Um, I think what we're not uh, trying to condemn uh, is that what is happening in India is somehow unique and when it comes to everyday policing, but uh, certainly there are ways and strategies which are kind of implicated in longer histories of the subcontinent and it's people's contention with state and power. So if you have to grapple with a wider analysis of how policing works in non-US context, we have to make space for uh, movements and analysis that can find solidarities beyond the binaries of global north and global south. And some of the intuitive aspects of movements and movement actors in each of these communities have to be the starting point of these efforts, uh, we think. And um, the particularities of policing in India or elsewhere and the history in which these practices are taking place can kind of help us better understand the character of uh, global policing and you know strengthen our efforts to uh, resist it as well. So yeah, I, I, I hope I've not gone over time. We've not gone over time, but thank you for listening to us and taking part in this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, that, that was really, really good. Um, I feel like the, you know, the accumulation of protest is so crucial to our understanding of the relationship between policing and you know, forms of racial nationalism. And I do think that it's something that goes under the radar a lot. Um, dominant narratives of kind of like police violence. Um, and what about it not just being a unique thing, I think is very important increase in the UK with the, uh, the PC bill and the increasing criminalization of protests that that will enable. Um, I think anyone who has any questions, please do raise their hand and I will, um, uh, I will get you. Uh, for now, I thought I'd ask uh, one question. I have to, um, you spoke about the mischaracterization of protesters, how uh, that can uh, draw into uh, public hostility. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the mischaracterization of the armor themselves. Because I know in kind of in the UK at least, uh, the farm or the or farms have a very particular kind of identity or a particular stereotype as kind of uh, rich um, landowners um, that vote conservative have vast control over, over rural land. And I wonder if there's a key distinction here between kind of farmers and farm workers, um, and whether that distinction applies in this context as well. And maybe a broader question about political identity, like we've seen in the Netherlands with um, uh, farmers' protests and how it's kind of picked up by the right wing media uh, as something to celebrate, which is quite odd, right? Like, why are right wing media out there supporting this? Um, and it kind of this distortion of anti climate change agenda, like kind of co opted this movement. I just wonder whether that has any kind of bearing on how political identities. Um, due to this, and are there limits to our solidarity, um, or is it a matter of kind of re diagnosing, correcting the record about what these people stand for as a system they're putting? 
Um, I think uh, I, I'd like to answer that also, I mean, extend that further, actually, in the sense that uh, even mainstream media uh, within India was not able to capture, I think, the diversity of who the protest participant is. There is mischaracterization and what, you know, the right-wing media or uh, the government propaganda will do of protests everywhere. But um, I think every I, and some I, I invite everyone to kind of reflect on this uh it is actually very difficult for media to kind of as the protest is going on to consolidate uh what is happening so i remember I, I remember very particularly also reading you know the kind of um reporting on women's participation within the uh farmers protest that happened um on on the one hand, there was a, a major glorification of, oh, look, there are women participating in the protest. That is amazing. That gives it some kind of a pristine or, you know, it, it makes it more sympathetic. Uh, that, that was the signal to the common person. But actually, there was a full ignorance of the fact that there are entire protests that happen all year round, you know, of uh, women workers in the capital city or they're very women, you know, being a part of the, the protest is actually very, very common, but using and extracting that identity to paint the picture of the movement, I think even mainstream media was guilty of doing that. Uh, and completely ignoring, as you said, like uh, farm laborers, their agenda, why they are uh, not participating or uh, why they, um, refused to up till a certain point uh, to come to the protest as well. There was no kind of coverage uh, at all. Um, there was no kind of a deeper understanding of what historically the, the relationship between big landowners and farm laborers is within the rural countryside. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, the problem starts right at the beginning with the main, how the mainstream media covers it. And then of course there's going to be mischaracterization and like this kind of, you know, there were headlines like, oh, look, the farmers are eating pizza at the protests. And so that was like, as you said, like the, the mischaracterization or whatever, the scandalizing was to the, the extent that these are poor people. They don't know what, you know, pizzas are limited to, I don't know not, what the intention was, like pizzas are something that people only in the cities and rich people can eat. So how is this, like they couldn't get their head around the fact that, oh, they are now eating pizza. So that is something to scan like. Like, so I think, yeah, I, I, they, there's a, yeah, I think that, I, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but yeah. Sammy, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to make one small point and maybe Shelza, you can talk about it further if you'd like. Um, I think that the, the point you were making, Shelza, earlier about the diversity of, of the protesters, uh, that also was inflected by uh, the caste diversity that, that the protesters did have, but, but the people that, so there was a lot of artwork and there was a lot of photographs that were going uh, up about the protests. And um, there was a very specific characterization of who the farmer is um, that kind of negated and neglected there being some diversity even within the farmers and the, their own unions and organizations. So um, we, I think, also saw that and uh, that was also pretty consistent in alternative media, which was sympathetic towards the, the protest as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And it's funny because you say, um... The, the media just looking at the uh, protests and eating pizza. And I think a broader of uh, it's testament to a broader thing is whenever you see people, I don't know, smiling or, ha or having fun or I don't know, enjoying themselves collectively resisting, that's seen as like a, a delegitimization of what they're doing, as if uh, coming together and actually resisting can be quite a rewarding thing to do, even if it's also very demanding um, and demanding struggle as well. Um, if anyone didn't have any other questions, then I'd like to. Uh, thank both Shailta and Samuel for just a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really enlightening. Um, and maybe we can all come back together at the end um, if there's any more questions to kind of bring all together. Um, yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for sharing the slides. That was, yeah, it was great. Um, our next speaker is uh, Renu Odiwala. Um, and Renu, you said you have a video to share before you start. If you if it works. Yes, uh, thank you. 
Okay, that works. Uh, I share screen. just wanted to share that so that we could get like a context of what um, the NSAS movement was about uh, for us in, in Nigeria. Uh, could be dealt with a lot of things that, uh, you know, uh, Samia and, and, and Chama were saying regarding the police repression that is happening in, the, in, in, in India, because it is like really similar to what is going on in Nigeria as well. Uh, for SAS, SAS was, uh, police unit for us in Nigeria that was set up to combat issues of hand robbery and, and crime and kidnapping. But then over time, they turned into uh, uh, the police oppressors uh, themselves. They became the actual oppressors, they became the actual criminals, they became the actual kidnappers. Um, they were uh, cursing a lot of oppression that was happening in the country, extorting a lot of young Nigerians. Um, there was a lot of torture, a lot of extrajudicial killings for the video. You know, there were a lot of names that were mentioned in the in the video. And those names are just a fraction of young Nigerians that have died at the hands of uh, police brutality. So that was how the entire protest started in, in Nigeria, you know, to fight against um, what was happening, and, you know, to speak out, to say that we're tired of, of dying at the end of police brutality at the end of police harassment and this cannot go on again and then you know uh, the movement was shut down which is why related with what uh, Shema was saying regarding how the government uses the police the instrument of the state to also repress movement because then um, on the 28th of October 2020 uh, police officers were sent to to the protest ground to go and shoot at protesters. And a lot of protesters actually died as a result of that. We may not actually even know the number of people that died because what, what then happened was that in collaboration uh, with the military, uh, police officers and the military shot a lot of people, injured a lot, maimed a lot of people, killed a lot of people, and then cut their bodies uh away so that there would be no evidence of, of of that crime and then this also speaks to you know like i said the repression uh where where people the people are as united they're strong but then the the strength of bullets is actually stronger and then impressions can actually can actually shut down movements um and then looking at also the topic when we were talking about police repression beyond the United States, for, for us in Nigeria, the murder of George Floyd uh, was one that resonated with us. You know, we're no, we're no strangers to police brutality. The hands ass movement began far back as in, since 2016. And then sort of watching the West stand up for George Floyd, uh, meanwhile, for us, it has always been about normalizing 
uh, police repression, normalizing the fact that uh, police can tell you that they would shoot you and nothing will happen and nothing will actually um, happen because the state would not prosecute those police officers. They would not be arrested. They would not be the, the child to court or sent to prison. So it was a sort of fuel to the hunger that has been rising uh, over over the years. And I think that was a writer that said that if some of us in Nigeria didn't see how uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters in America, you know, sort of forced some of their governments to defund the police department, we wouldn't have believed that it, it, was, it was possible for any action to be taken against the police because we have been used to crying out for so long into the MTA without response from the government. And so, so what we do, I mean, they, the platform I run now is sort of like an organization, uh, it's called Connect Hub. It's a platform that has been set up to defend the rights of young people in Nigeria and also do a lot of um, documentation about the state's violence and the extrajudicial killings that are happening in Nigeria. And that was why I love uh, Shama's, uh, Shama's detail, um, detailed presentation because then they actually give the numbers. What we're also trying to do is to get the numbers. For example, we've documented close to a thousand cases that have just happened this year and that's all via uh, uh, social media reporting, uh, you know, people tagging, saying that police has just harassed me, the police has just extorted me, uh, someone has been extrajudicially killed in our community uh, um, by the police, and we're trying to track these numbers. Because then the fight for NSAS has, has gone off the streets, and the media may not probably put so much attention uh, on, on it again, doesn't mean that the fight has stopped. It doesn't mean that police brutality has ended. It doesn't mean that um, this menace of harassment uh, has stopped. And I was also part of the judicial panel of inquiry uh, in Lagos, where we asked that panels of inquiry be set up to look into the independent panels, to look into those issues, these issues of this extrajudicial killings, these issues of torture, and make sure that the officers are brought to book and one of the most defining moments for me um, on the panel was when uh, a mother came to the panel and said that uh, she has been looking for herself for 12 years. She has disappeared in the uh, judicial institutions and is nowhere to be found. And because she saw her son at the police station and they asked her to go and bring money so that her cell could be built. And when she came back, they said that, you know, your son is dead and there's nothing you can do about it. And then for 12 years, she has been looking for closure. And, and she said to me at the panel, if he's not alive again, they need to release his dead body, you know, so that I can bury him and get some sort of closure um, and, 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 and move on. And so these are some of the concerns uh, about our policing institutions where uh, increasingly citizens are getting uh, are getting killed, citizens are, get, are, get, are getting no justice at the hands of the institutions that are supposed to give them justice. They're getting killed by the people that are supposed to be protecting them. And then uh, the, the, the Nigerian state is, is, is looking on. And then so for us, for movement like, you know, Black Lives Matter, and an NSAS also exposes um, our concerns regarding complex policy issues like policing institutions, uh, criminal justice reform, you could see that with looking at this movement and what is happening in India as well, it's adding to the growing discussion on the use of civic pressure, you know, true, true protest, true, true social movement um, for policy security, the society that we're seeking. And then at the heart of this movement, you can see that there are young people who have always suffered the consequences of uh, police repression, of police brutality, of, of police harassment. And then uh, for us also in Nigeria, uh, our police uh, have never been built to serve the people. You could think it's probably, you know, just trying to draw straws, but then the Nigerian police force uh, could be an example. They weren't, they weren't brought up or they weren't established to, 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 to be a service to the people, to protect the people. They were established to exert force, you know, um, on, on the people, so they, they were established, you know, by the colonial class to be able to make sure that the people were kept under suppression and oppression. And then, to, when, even after the colonial 
colonial class left. Um, they have not stopped. They have not been uh, be engineered or retort, you know, to actually be a service to the people. So it's amazing that uh, people in the in the West, you know, in the United States can talk about Black Lives Matter movement and, and police brutality or maybe major issues like racism. But then for us in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is like the world's most populous Black nation. Uh, uh, on her, so I think there's a study that, that said that um, everyone in, in four Africans is, is a Nigerian. So in every four Africans, you find at least one Nigerian. And then for us in the, in the city, in the nation of the world most populous, you know, black country, we still have to tell our police, we still have to tell the government that black lives matter. And so, and somebody offered in and how to survive for this brutality in Nigeria. One, expect it to happen. Two, run for your day life. Three, suffer in silence if you cannot escape. Um, four, hope to get to the police station in one piece because there could be a possibility that there's an educated officer there. Because then we have, we are recruiting people who do not understand what policing should be into the service. We are recruiting, for me in my words, I say we are recruiting mad people. Um, into the into the police force, we are putting our guns into the hands of mentally unstable people who should not be in the police force at all, uh, because some of them even bribe their way into the force. Uh, five don't use big words with Nigerian police officers. Don't use words like extravagant, uh, you know, these big words because they don't understand what you're saying. Six do as you're told. Seven be polite, even if they're aggravating you. You can tell them that you can tell a Nigerian police that I know my rights, so stop harassing me. Just be polite. And then eight, hope that all your relatives, you know, find you fast because you could disappear in the system. They could kill you off in the police station and make sure that no one finds you. In 2012, uh, there was a, a news uh, that broke out in the country where about close to, I think more than 20 bodies uh, so were found in a river in the Southeast in Nigeria. There was the, 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 the bodies of young um, Nigerians who have been tortured and harassed in a police cell in Nigeria. It's one of the most notorious uh, SAS police cells units in Anambra state. I think that, that article is actually online. And those bodies were dumped in the river uh, by the policemen. Until today, nobody has been held accountable. Nobody has been jailed. Nobody has been, um, you know, sent to prison for, you know, those bodies that were found. So for us, uh, the police have always been used um, by the ruling class, you know, by the incumbent party uh to serve their own to serve their own interests to serve their own alignment when you have issues of insecurity currently that is plaguing nigeria of this moment the nigerian police is nowhere to be found but then when it is time to extort and harass and brutalize and extrajudicially kill uh young nigerians then uh, you can find them there for us also uh this is the right to existence uh we have been dealt with a lot of things you know for, for for nigerians you have to ask the government for a better life you have to ask the government for jobs for safe spaces but then you can't even ask for these things when you're still struggling uh, uh to leave and that was what led some of us onto the street during the entire um, movement and made me become a frontliner because then a 16 year old girl was killed her name uh was tina Ezekwe. She was a school leaver that was supposed to write her school leaving exams and was killed by a police uh, officer, uh, by stray blood of a drunk police officer. And then to me, um, it was a case of someone, an average person, just like me in Nigeria, because also I think she was killed a few days by the police a few days after Judge Floyd. And um, for me, the issues that it embodied was marginalization because I know that coming from a marginalized community myself, my family would have been in Tina's parents' shoes with no access to justice, with no access to help. So I was obligated to rise up and do something because I didn't uh, want to die. And also, you know, like Shama said, for us too, the police has been 
uh, the repressive hogai uh, of state rule. They have been the means by which our lives, our safety, have been placed at the mercy of bureaucratic and, and personalistic uh, uh, rulers who use them, you know, for what they want, control the police for what they want. Um, they are being protected by the police. Rather than the police protecting the people, the police are only protecting the interest uh, of the rich here. So for me, I, I think that those are some of the issues, the fact that, um, our police, like I said, it's, they're not they're not actually for the people. They are for the one percent of the one percent, the politicians that can afford to um, to make sure that they are doing their will. Uh, they've also, ever since time in memory, as far as Nigerians can know, um, even right before independence, always been a repressive program for Nigerians. Uh, and there have been a lot of extrajudicial killings, undocumented, that has been ongoing in the country. Um, even before the NSAS protest started. And the NSAS protest as well, you could see uh, what young Nigerians were on the street for more than or close to two weeks talking about, you know, asking for accountability for a particularly brutal uh, uh, police police force that are responsible for dozens of extrajudicial killings, torture and, and ill treatment. I tell, you know, people that you think of the worst thing that can happen to police here, uh, and it wouldn't still come close to what happens in the Nigerian uh, police um, cells, because then it's, it's much more uh, worse than that. So that has been, uh, and then during the protests as well, you saw how you can, you could see how the same thing the Nigerian, young Nigerians were fighting against, were shouting against, were on the street against, crying against, um, repeated itself, you know, we did that and, 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 and the repression. Also, there have been a lot of people that are still in prison um, by the, for just protesting uh, against police brutality. And I said to myself, we were asking for an end to police brutality. And then we're still facing the police brutality uh, uh, during protests where so many young people were killed. Like I said, you know, that was, uh, uh, we mean others have been arrested unjustly, unjustly rather. Um, bank accounts were found to frozen. Passports were seized. The passport was seized as well. People were placed on, on no-fly list and, and couldn't um, leave the country. Other had to leave the country through um, other means rather than the airport. A lot of people were detained by the state's uh, security service just for simply asking. Uh, for an end uh, to police brutality, just for, for simply asking for a right to leave. And then for us in Nigeria, like I said, again, the role of the police is to maintain the social order, you know, so that those in power can do their business with the least amount of instruction possible. If you know that the police can come to your house and pick you up and you could get to disappear in the jail, uh, in the prison for years, I mean, I'm also, my organization, we're also working with a lot of prison reform um, institutions. And you find people that have been in jail for uh, a lot of years, 11 years, 12 years, 15 years, for not committing any crime. The only crime they've committed is refusing to be extorted by the police or being in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. And some of these people, when we try to get their release, they are not, not no compensation at all. Um, comes from the state is different from um, in the West where if people are unjustly incarcerated, they get some sort of compensation. For us, it doesn't happen uh, uh, that way um, for, for the policing institution in Nigeria. As well, some of these issues are also caused by the working conditions that the governments provide the same police, the same police that it relies on to, to beat up protesting people uh, or, or, or young people. And then this precarious situation make the police turn to their guns and their uniforms as an extra means, you know, or a means of earning an extra income, you know. Um, and, and that's what happens uh, basically in, in Nigeria. And that's what we're still dealing with on astronomical scale, you know as the day increases. Because even if the protests, the global movement of answers happened in 2020, there was a bit of respite uh, for like three months where the police were sort of cowed. But because of the attitude of the state uh, government, where I like to say that Nigerian politicians 
or our leaders are not interested in ending police brutality. They have no will to do so because the police serve their interest of suppression. They serve their interest uh, of domination. They serve their interest of, of suppression. So why should I end the police brutality enables to be in power? And so we've had an increase in cases of extortion, harassment, and extrajudicial killings happen in the country since 2020. And it seems like there is no uh, light at the end of the tunnel for Nigerians as we keep um, dealing with this police brutality if the government of the day doesn't rise, rise and do something about it. However, um, I think that we've managed to record a lot of um, small wins which should not be discounted. So I would say in, in you know, pattern that there will always be resistance to change. Change will not just give way at, at once. Um, but then as you keep on doing what you can do to make sure that the system change, um, things will definitely get better. So there will things there will always be resistance to change, but without your actions, without our conversations, with us, you know, having the social movement and keep pushing, it'll get better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudy. That was um, a really powerful ending as well um, to give us some hope and uh, some courage to keep going. I think um, you know it's really useful to have a perspective of somebody on the ground, um, you know, fighting for this stuff every day. And another testimony of how Black Lives Matter beyond uh, the United States um, and how the struggles have been on have been going on for a long time, um, a lot longer than. What some people are currently waking up to, um, and you've been fighting this for a long time, and it's ongoing. Um, it's not something you can opt out of and back in. Uh, so thank you so much for that really, really powerful um, talk. Um, I wanted to open up to questions, um, if anybody has any. Um, just unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand or, or whatever. Um, may in the meantime, while you're raising your hands, um, I thought I just had one question, which was, um, it, it kind of ties into what Shelter and Samuel were saying, which is that we need to go beyond the decision between the global south, global north. Um, and because I find myself caught in two um, sentiments, which is one, we need to go beyond the US. Um, but then two, when we do, we can see a lot of people in the so global north kind of pointing to the global south to kind of exceptionalize them to say look how tyrannical um look how barbaric these these nations are these systems of police violence and i almost find myself going back and saying no no hold, hold on a minute like um you're you're right from the us uh which is some of the most barbaric police violence so i kind of catch myself confusing these two um, ideas and i wondered if you have that kind of frustration um, or how you navigate this idea of um, shedding a, shining a spotlight on police violence um, in Nigeria, out kind of um, giving in colonial narratives that then exceptionalize these forms of police violence. Is that something you feel yourself navigating? I, I want you to sort of rephrase the question. I think get the question properly. Sure. So I just wondered if you find yourself um, fighting against two, two different narratives, which is one, um, not wanting to exceptionalize best, but then also not wanting to um, give in to colonial narratives, which often exceptionalize um, country in Africa and to kind of point to these countries almost uncivilized. And I wondered if you if you face that colonial narrative when you when you give talks and when you speak to people, or is maybe that's not something you um, experience. Yeah, of course, we've had to uh, deal with some of the, you know, colonial narratives regarding uh, the policing institutions um, that, that are happening in Nigeria. However, I like to say that uh, the colonials have left Nigeria since um, the 1960s. And this is the 21st century. We are still dealing with politicality. And uh, for me, I, I see it as, even if if the left company is bad, I mean you have the you have the power now to change it into into a good um, uh, force for yourself and, and for your nation. So for me, it is that the what I say as well is that the rulers 
um, inherited something and they didn't want it to change. So they also kept using that system so also for the, uh, their own interests. So if we wanted to change, as the Nigerian government, so all our successive rulers rather, wanted to change the state of policing in Nigeria since the 1960s, they would have. But then, like I said, uh, in the in the world's most populous Black nation, or not, we still have to remind Black that that the Black lives still matter. Our own Black leaders are still looking at Nigerians, um, and just the hands of hands of officers uh, on the street are being extorted, and they're, and they're not doing about anything about it. So, would we really say it is still about colonial oppression, or would we just say? This is just, you know, people being humans, being oppressive humans uh, in general. So at times, you know, those, those, those narratives uh, uh, could come up. But I think that for us in Nigeria, it's, it's about um, leaders or rulers, you know, institutions of the state that um, I've never thought about them serving the people, but then serving their own interests. Did I answer that question? Thanks so much. Um, Vanessa, you have your hand up. Thanks for joining us as well. Yeah, thank you. And apologies uh, for being late and that I missed a, yeah, I just actually jumped into the last uh, present, no, the, the, the presentation before. Um, I'm Vanessa Thompson. I'm an abolitionist scholar working in Europe, but with movements um, all over the Black diaspora, uh, particularly about police abolition, but how this is also connected to border abolition, the abolition of militarism, the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I was wondering, and maybe this could also speak um, also to the presenter um, before, because I do Although I, I do completely agree with the critique of US centrism, and that's not only a critique that unfolds in the so-called global North and South, that's something we've also seen in Europe, right? That many black movements, um, because it's not only that police has this kind of colonial institution externally, but also the role in terms of settler colonialism, and even within Europe itself, the founding of the police was necessary for the establishment of racial capitalism, right? Even within Europe, the police was always there to punish the poor and to make bodies um, 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 uh, suitable for capitalist exploitation. And of course, Franz Fanon has shown how this translates in the, in the colonial context, that it was super brute, super violent, super violent to gain the kind of super exploitation. And I'm wondering, um, because I do agree with the kind of that we need to decenter the US, but I would also um, suggest to to look at more the kind of transnational formations that are already happening, like a lot of like as an activist scholar and working with black movements in Europe, a lot of the movements are already drawing the connections like, for instance, there were several manifestation in solidarity with NSAS in Berlin in Frankfurt and not only by the Nigerian community but really like trying to understand a black international and what was interesting that that was even then i mean we can see that now also with solidarity with what is happening in sudan right where we see massive uh, police uh, repression and i think there questions come up um and that's what i'm looking at in my work of an abolitionist international like how various solidarity movements are already building transnational connections although they're very very porous um, and even kind of vulnerable. And I was wondering, um, Reno, if you could talk more on that, on the kind of transnational dimensions of these struggles, like are movements connected also beyond Nigeria and how that looks like? And also um, because abolition is always about alternatives, right? About the kind of different worlds um, that are built without punishment and without exploitation. And how would you see actually abolitionist practices um, that are already in place? Like defund is one strategy of abolition of course, um, but I don't know, are there kind of models like transformative justice, you know, to really try to not only keep the police away, but to find different modes of being safety within the communities? Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, th thank you very much. And I'll start from the last part, uh, you know. So there is this saying in, in Nigeria where the police say, the, they say that the police force motto is the police is your friend. So they all, they repeat that a lot. 
and I do a bit of spaces where I invite uh, public leaders and and you know top leaders in the society to come and discuss one of it's on Twitter Twitter Spaces, and then I had the the public relations officer you know of the police Nigerian police force come on the space because uh, there was a case there were rising cases of extortion in one of the north central states in Nigeria and we need to talk about that. And he said, the police is your friend. They were trying to, the fact that, because I asked the question, why are there police everywhere? Every, every, every stop in, in the streets in this state, you have police everywhere. You know, we get the fact that Nigeria is ravaged by insecurity and terrorism, but then that's not in the South, that's happening in the North. And in the North where there is a lot of insecurity and terrorism, you don't even have the police there. So the, the basis of being on the streets is not for the protection of the community. It is for extortion. It is for indiscriminate arrest. Uh, they could just go into a neighborhood, just like uh, Shamia Sham said, and arrest people and, and, and take them off to detention. And then you don't know that those those, those people are, are there. Those people can be legally detained there for, for days and you don't know they're there because they want to extort them. So why are the police on the streets when there is no imminent threat in the South? And then he talked about community policing and, uh, and the fact that they need to they need to be on the street. I said community policing is not about police being everywhere. It's not about police not the stops each each and every point of why is the public relations officer of the Nigerian police force telling me that public community policing is about having the police stationed every few meters. By the time you, you leave this they had the next stop extorting you leave this stop they had the next topic you could find like hundreds of police checkpoints um in a particular state why are you telling me that is related to community policing that is not related to community policing um, at all. we don't even have enough police officers in nigeria that is where we can't um talk about defunding the police as a strategy uh in in nigeria with, with the movement because these guys are even barely funded uh in the first place however we could talk about community policing but then talking with one of the highest, highest uh ranked you know police officer and it's relating community policing to something else it's not definitely um what do you think they are going to say because then these guys don't understand what they're saying they probably just got this the, the, the word from somewhere and then they think that they're doing the job and then they're not doing the job. And one of the things we're talking about also is community policing, is that the police need to work together in tandem with the neighborhood to be able to make sure that crime rates are reduced, to be able to make sure that um, the, uh, the, the public gives information, timely information to the police on time and reduce the, the rate of crimes and also the presence of the police in this neighborhood. But then what do you find also is that we have a trust deficit with our institutions. I mean, a lot of Nigerians uh, from the government to the judicial institutions, there is a trust gap where the police today no longer trust the, 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 the citizens today no longer trust the police. Approaching a police checkpoint for me as a Nigerian, is I feel distaste, I feel anger, I feel frustration because then I know these people are going to do something to me that I would not get justice. Uh, um, so there is a lot of anger. You find that there are cases of citizen retaliation against police officers in some part, part of Nigeria now because then people have seen that the government is not going to offer any sort of help uh, or justice. So they are choosing to go after uh, the police themselves. So for us in the Nigerian uh, entire context, we do not um, bring in the defunding police because then we also have issues of insecurity and terrorism. And then the government comes and say, uh, and particularly when you start talking about defunding the police, then you find that um, the police do not respond to emergencies at all. Uh, and then they are kept off from their normal post, they don't respond to emergency response calls, they don't respond to any sort of criminal activity, and then the government deliberately takes them off the streets so that there could be more criminal activity on the street. And then so that the general populace would say, oh, these guys were, were preventing a bit of the crime, so return them. And so it's, 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 a, it's a very hard struggle. Um, for us in Nigeria, it's when it has to do with a, a abolition, you know, of the police and all of that. But then uh, also we we have a militarized state in Nigeria, and the government 
pins that on the insecurity and the terrorism. You have military everywhere. Uh, you have guns everywhere. You have uniforms everywhere. Uh, it's, it's very restrictive. Even in one of the, even in the safest states, you still have these guys um, stationed everywhere. And it is hard for you to talk about it. It is hard for you to say this is not how people should be living because the the issue of uh, insecurity is there. The issue of terrorism is there. The issue of harm, harm robbery is there. The issue of crime is there. So I think for us, what we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, if people that are in the police force are at least psychologically stable people um, to be able to effectively police the individuals. I was saying earlier that we have mad people in the police force in Nigeria. They're not mentally stable people. And that's why one of the requests for the NSAS movement um, was the psychological evaluation of these police officers, of each of them, for us to be able to know that these guys that were putting our guns into their hands are psychologically stable. Also, we're asking for an increase uh, in their salary um, so that they will not have to turn to using their guns to extort the citizens. One of the things we did uh, was to also set up inquiries, panels of inquiries to be able to look uh, into the actions uh, of the police. What have they been doing? Who have they extorted? Who have these guys killed? Can they come to the panel? But then you find out that there, there are also um, a bit of people do not want to come out. People have given up on any form of institution that wants to um, sort of give them justice, right? So, I mean, basically, I said earlier, what, what we are trying to do on their hands is document, keep documenting these cases, keep keep tracking up these cases, because every effort that we want to make would not come to fruition if we do not have a government that is willing to act. But then our government is currently also resisting the civic pressure that people are putting on uh, to be able to make sure that they do anything. And I already said the reason for that. Also for the transnational uh, you know, social movement that are currently happening today, you have uh, people taking from probably what has happened to George Floyd and seeing you know, how a, a black man has been killed in the West and, and the states did not want to do anything about it. So what we're doing now is taking strength from each movement, taking strength from the movement happening in, in Myanmar, uh, in Sudan, they fixed the country in Ghana, uh, Gambia has decided, uh, SSOT in South Sudan, um, movement happening uh, in Senegal and, and, and taking strength from each other. So you have that during the NSAS movement, people were not just uh, protesting in Nigeria, just like you said, you had people in London, you had people in America, and they, some of them, a majority of them maybe were not even Nigerians, they were just people that found uh, found voices and, and wanted to support you know, the movement, wanted to have solidarity to the movement. So I think that we also need some of that, a lot of that today, because there will be repression in our states. But then when the governments, uh, these governments we have today see that there is solidarity across borders, they will be forced to do something. So if young people have been shot and killed in Nigeria and the, the young people in New York are still protesting, they will have to do something because then even if you take young people off the streets in Nigeria or in London, you can't take them off the streets in every country. Not every, not every government, you know, can't can do that. And I think that that is very important. Uh, that's also an important lesson we learned for us in Nigeria that your movement should not just be restricted to your country. It should be intercontinental, actually. There were people protesting in Ghana. I met one last week. He told me they were protesting at the Nigerian embassy. He's a Kenyan. They were protesting at the Nigerian embassy in Kenya during the protest. I didn't know that they were protesting in Kenya. And it is also an opportunity to be able to, to know that your movement uh, has given hope to others, as they are also starting up their own social movement and taking experiences and lessons from what has happened uh, in Nigeria. I don't want to take a lot of time. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Oliver. No, thank you very much for uh, that really deep response. Really appreciate it. Um, I know that Leandro had his hand up, but I think. I know that Shisha and Sham and Samia want to respond to the question. Um, Leanne, was yours another question or was it uh, you, all good? Okay, because then we've got to get to uh, the Andrew presentation as well. In but Shelt and Samia, if, please you offer maybe some brief responses to Vanessa. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll try to keep it brief and I uh, just want to say uh, that I resonated a lot with what Reno was saying. Uh, about the mechanics of how the police actually operates uh, within the global South, specifically within the Indian context. 
and while she was presenting as well, I think the one point, if I was to think about, if I had to stress on something which is particularly non-US specific is the, the how embedded police impunity is within these countries. And she said it very well. And how historically the distrust of the state and the police is actually built in. We, uh, it's sometimes surprising to me uh, that we don't have equivalent you know, kind of uh, social movements as the Black Lives Matter or, um, you know, this kind of systematic understanding of the police within the South Asian context, but we have community understandings of the, the fact that police is bad. So that is not equivalent to having campaigns that are built around having specific demands, but the communities live in specific ways where they know that, you know, in this era in 1980, all communities were like this particular minority was completely, you know, um, uh, raised out from this particular city by the police and uh, whatnot. So uh, it's sometimes surprising, but also it's not, it, it's also the way these countries or the, the violence in these countries, uh, the way that communal policing in these countries, uh, I think, functions. Uh, the other thing I think uh, what also Renu uh, uh, kind of responded with was the idea of uh, uh, community policing as one of the responses that U.S. you know that that brings in, uh, just adding to that that the community within again the global south or the specifically the Indian context is very complicated. And Soumya uh, said that uh, in her presentation that you know the understanding that now the uh, foot soldiers of this government, which are known as the RSS, are appointed and have historically been appointed with forces of the state as police friends, police mitters to kind of police um, uh, my, uh, minorities, police religious and uh, other minorities in the country to do their bidding, to do the bidding of the state, which is corporatization, which is uh, communal violence. So again, like if you say community policing in India, it'll be a different, different context. You know, it is, it'll be casteist, it'll be gendered, it'll be uh, so it is a confusion from my end as well, coming from the Indian context, how we talk about abolition, which obviously that is something that we understand as activists and uh, whatnot, but how do we translate that in the Indian context? And the other thing is obviously, again, uh, defunding the police. Does the, the does the Indian police even get that much money to for us to be actually saying that we need to defund the police? Um, and, you know, the fact that the U.S. is the global police. It, it, the war on terror meant that uh, 2000s onwards, we had laws uh, which specifically targeted through the U.N. resolution uh, minorities and Muslims, even in India, uh, anti-terror laws that specifically, you know, criminalized uh, such a large population. What does that kind of also mean in this, you know, um, yeah, so those so many thoughts and so many confusions when I remember also reading so much around the agenda of what abolition means and how it actually translates, because I do not find myself, and that could, can be my limitation, and uh, find myself actually uh, resonating with it, although I do understand the intuitions of doing this. So because violence is so central, but in a very different way within the um, global South or the Indian context. So yeah, that that were my preliminary thoughts that and and doubts, of course. Thanks, Shabza. Do you have something you want to say as well? Yeah, I'll try. I'll try to be quick. Um, I know this is a very big topic, and uh, maybe we'll have time in the end to talk about it. Um, thank you, Renu. I think I also like shells are related a lot to the kinds of harm that you're seeing. Um, and I also really appreciate your question, Oliver, about um, the managing the global south and global north uh, thing. I just wanted to say one point about that, that I think that it seems so uh, for much of the year, most of the time I'm in the US because that's where I'm doing my doctoral studies. And I feel very much that that point comes up for me when I'm there because it's relevant there to remind people that there isn't a unique barbarism happening in the colonies of uh, outside, but actually it's pretty pretty barbaric all around when it comes to the police. Um, so, but when I'm in India, I don't feel like that struggle comes up for me, and I'm much more geared towards you know listening to other people from the global south, sharing this experience and having a conversation with them. 
um, which kind of shifts the, the context, I think shifts my perspective a little bit. And I thought that might be useful to think about. Um, I also wanted to say that I, I really appreciate um, uh, your comments, Vanessa, about the existing uh, transnational solidarities. Um, and here, this is something Shelda and I talk about a lot, because I think that if you were to look at the US context, you will find also similarly that in community, it, there is racism like that's not if you just leave it to the community, you will still find the punitive techniques reproducing themselves. And so which is why the point that we tend to make is that the abolition like abolition would not be possible in the Indian context without the annihilation of caste like it won't happen without that in the same kind of way that it won't happen without the abolition of racial capitalism. So I think that those are all fairly interconnected things. But the point that we were trying to make also through our presentation was to say that if you were to appreciate the particularities of um, the mechanisms and logics of policing, it allows you to think of the ways that we can get to a different world and a transformative world very differently. So for example, the defund the police example allows us to see that, that maybe defund the police is not the answer here, even if our goals end up are, are similar, maybe that is not the tactic that we necessarily need. And so using the same tactics may not actually end up and help us end up in the same kind of uh, transformative world that we want to see or abolitionist world that we want to see. Um, yeah, just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. That has really helped write you brought together. I think loads of confusing thoughts in my mind and you articulated it really well. So thanks to all of you for that. Um, I just wanted to now bring in Leandro. Um, sorry, it's slightly over from Leandro. Um, and hopefully we can get over the obviously no pressures and of you needs to um, needs to leave. Um, so Leandro, uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. First off, uh, thank you for all previous uh, com uh, presentations. Um, it's been really, really enlightening and uh, inspiring. And even though it's, I mean, the topics that we 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 work on are are very heavy, of course, uh, and also the comments. So, uh, my name is Leandro. Uh, uh, I work at Stockholm University, I'm a criminologist, um, and I uh, will, let's see if I can make this work. Uh, I, yeah, I will, I will address some of the topics that, or some of the questions that you have uh, brought up during the other presentation, but my presentation uh, differs, of course, because uh, I work from Sweden, which is a, a very small country with 9 million inhabitants compared to, I mean, Nigeria or India, which are uh, uh, have different histories. So, um, but I'm going to uh, start briefly by presenting myself and then uh, highlight my work on, on racial profiling, uh, which I've been, been uh, working on for the, couple, the last couple of years. And then uh, address the question of the, the of the workshop, which is, I mean, thinking or theorizing beyond the, the United States, and uh, yeah, and then finally uh, open up for 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 questions. So that's my my plan for these 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I think I already presented myself. I'm a, a criminologist. I'm a activist scholar working with uh, uh, currently with a, a community center in Husby, which I will uh, talk a little bit more about. Uh, and Husby is situated in one of the poorest neighborhoods in, in, in Stockholm, which is the capital of, 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 uh, of Sweden. Uh, so, uh, but I get to that. So uh, on, on the topic of racial profiling. So this, uh, the, the question uh, was, uh, <laughs> my daughter is here in my house, so uh, I'll be close to window, sorry. Um, so in 2013, uh, suddenly this discussion appeared in Sweden. Uh, and it was, so, so it's the topic of racial profiling has been, I mean, discussed in the Swedish context for not so many years. Uh, and what happened in 2013 was that we had, uh, and uh, um, we had a, a police operation, uh, which is the photo uh, on the bottom, uh, 
which was uh, targeting uh, so-called illegal immigrants, where they were trying to identify uh, people and in, in order to, to uh, deport them. So, and, and, and what did the police do? Well, they uh, went to different subway, subway stations and stopped people who don't look Swedish. And what does that mean? Well, I mean, uh, and this is a, a, a central uh, uh, problem in the Swedish uh, context, which is that uh, the idea is that Sweden is just a white country. So Swedes are white. But the problem is that uh, Swede, uh, Sweden has uh, transformed because of uh, immigration since the 1970s. And even before that, I mean, the idea of Sweden as a white country is actually a very, uh, I mean, it's a, a construction, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the point with the, uh, the other scandal that happened in 2013 also uh, underlines, which is with a scandal with the police in the south of Sweden had been uh, registering all Roma people. And, and the Roma population has been around in Sweden for, for more than 500 years. And so they had like registered like 4,000 people who had not committed any crime, but because they were uh, Roma. So the, the, and the police in the first uh, instance, they were like, uh, this is not a illegal registration, but an, an, a file where we, so they had all these type of uh, arguments that they uh, put forward. But uh, in later stages, when uh, they were brought to, to, to justice and actually were condemned for, for discrimination, um, which I think uh, uh, is important to highlight that uh, we have uh, this one of the few cases in Sweden where the police has been, have been brought to justice because of problems with racism. Uh, but, and that this is a, a key, key point, nothing changes. So uh, the, the, the state is, is uh, uh, lost because the police as the, 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 the state as, um, were convicted for discrimination, but no police officer or no police chief was lost his job or her job. So nothing happens within the police organization. So these ideas still uh, exist within the, the police institution. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I mean, a, a very big problem in Sweden that uh, that uh, the police institution is intact. Uh, no matter how much criticism we, we bring forward or how much or or, or whatever happens uh, outside outside its 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 uh, parameters. So, so in two thousand and thirteen, we start to having this discussion about racial profiling. Uh, that doesn't mean, and that's. Uh, I think it's very important to, to underline. That doesn't mean that we haven't had po problems with police racism or discussion about discrimination within the police system, but we are very inspired by the US discussion. Uh, and then it is trans uh, translated into the Swedish context in 2013. Uh, and, and it is within that context and with that, that uh, movement or with that, I mean, the, the social movements who brought that topic to, to the forefront in the Swedish public domain that I wrote my dissertation, which is called Race and Order Critical Perspectives on Crime in Sweden. And I mean, Sweden is a very rich country and uh, we, we, I mean, my colleagues uh, within the criminological field, they do studies about everything, especially about uh, the crime of immigrant, uh, uh, of people with immigrant uh, descent or, I mean, there are different concepts and categories that are used to, to, to pinpoint groups racialized as non-white. But since the 1970s, there have been a numerous amount of studies uh, on this topic. While, I mean, and this is uh, uh, a big shortcoming, shortcoming, research on racism and especially research on racism and policing is extremely underdeveloped. I mean, um, the, 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 the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention, which is like a state organ, uh, state, in this, in state uh, uh, I mean, who do a lot of the, the, the uh, state-funded research concerning matters of crime. And, uh, uh, they, they uh, in a report, they, they uh, made the following comment. They said, bias treatment has hardly been studied in the other Nordic countries. And in Sweden, most studies are published before 2010. And after that, only three studies have that data material that covers the time period after 2010. 
and, and none of these newer studies address the police. So, I mean, in a, in a society like the Swedish one, where there's a lot of studies done on, I mean, whatever, uh, none of these or almost none address the problem with the police. So, so I think that's a very important, um, uh, I mean, as a researcher, that's the point from where I start to think. I mean, the, there's a big absence of, of, of knowledge. Uh, or at least academic knowledge, because within the communities, there's a lot of knowledge about police racism, of course. So, uh, you have to yeah, separate those. Uh, so what I've did, uh, what I've done during my research is that I've interviewed, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I've done interviews with police officers. Uh, I will not go into that uh, so much in these presentations, but I mean, when I interview police officers about racial profiling, they say, no, we don't. Uh, use this tactic, uh, etc. So they, so different forms of neutralization techniques are are invoked by the police to to say uh, race is not a topic or a matter in, within the Swedish context. We we work with facts. We work we work we're colorblind, etc. So, and then I I also of course uh, grounded my work uh, on on interviews with people subjected to racial or ethnic profiling. Um, so I, I've interviewed Afro Swedes, Muslims, uh, uh, people with Roma uh, background, uh, and, and I mean, and also many young men, especially young men uh, living in the peripheral, uh, more poorer neighborhoods, where the levels of uh, people with migrant background around is about, I mean, it can be up to eighty percent in some of these neighborhoods. So. That's where I've conducted my interview. So, and what I've also done is I've done this work with Folketsuspi, uh, uh, which is like a community center uh, in 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 Stockholm. I don't know if anybody have, has been to Stockholm, but uh, it's like in the one of the perifer peripheral areas, uh, one of the poorest areas, uh, and it is uh, surrounded by also Tensta and Rinkeby, and and these neighborhoods together are called the Järva Områder. Uh, and it's been the epicenter of, of deadly violence and shootings the last uh, years in Sweden with uh, nine people shot to death in Sweden in 2020. So, and I think also this number is, I mean, if you, uh, I don't know the numbers from Nigeria or, or India or even England, but I mean, Sweden is a very small country and uh, we, we have about 40 uh, um, killings which are re related to, to, to what the police call organized crime per year, more or less, 40, more or less. So if you have nine in one area, it's, it's a lot in that context. So, uh, but Yarva is also one of the poorest areas of Sweden with about 80 to 90% of the population with foreign background, depending on how you, how you count and how you measure it. And, and I mean, you see here some, some uh, news uh, footage on the, on the right side with, uh, with media cover uh, coming to, to address what is happening in Sweden with this, with this problem. Um, and, and theoretically, I, I think it's very important to underline that, I mean, Sweden has, has transformed a lot the last uh, decades. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a transformation of the welfare state into a very neoliberal uh, system. Uh, it is marked by welfare chauvinism, I think we see that across Europe, um, authoritarian populism, where, uh, hard, I mean, uh, our authorities are, 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 are uh, advancing uh, harder sentences, more policing, uh, I mean, also private security guards uh, having a, a, a more um, important role in society, etc. Et and then also penal nationalism or, or uh, penal race, racism, if you would, would, would like it, uh, because uh, those who are targeted are, of course, uh, uh, racialized minorities or, or, or ethnic minorities, uh, depending on the language you prefer. So, uh, and so uh, in, my, in my work, I've tried to highlight uh, the topic of racial profiling inspired by, the, by, by US writings and also uh, writings from the UK, of course. Uh, that's also why it's so interesting to hear about the, the, the experiences from, from both India and, and, and Nigeria, uh, and especially underlining it as an everyday experience of over-policing. Uh, 
uh, I mean, we don't have the problem with shoot, uh, deadly shootings from the police in the same amount as in the US context, or, or as you indicated, uh, you know, in, in Nigeria with, with all the problems who, who lead to, to like torture, et cetera, et cetera. But it is an, 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 an experience of everyday uh, policing. Uh, for example, this guy that I interviewed, a man who's 25, living in Stockholm, he said, I was out walking with a couple of friends. It was a regular evening, nothing special. Suddenly police stop in front of us. They get out and push us up against the car. It happened for no reason whatsoever. None of us was wearing anything strange. None of us had anything to do with the police before. It was a question of our appearance. We're black. So we saw another group of guys in front of us, all of them white. They went stop. This is something that happens continuously. I can tell you about several similar experiences. It's nothing unusual. So for, so for some segment of the patient, it's nothing uh, unusual to be stopped from a very early age, like 12, 13 years old, uh, and then you are continually stopped and harassed. Uh, uh, and I mean, there are, of course, uh, experiences of, of of violence in these encounters, I mean, uh, symbolic violence and other forms of I mean, direct violence. But uh, in many instances, what the police are, are doing is uh, asking for ID or, or trying to control in a more, I mean, violence in, the, in its most subtle forms, uh, in a sense. Um, uh, uh, and this guy in, in the bottom, it's a news uh, article about uh, a guy who was uh, Thomas, who uh, had been stopped for 150 times when he tried, when he worked in Copenhagen uh, and he uh, uh, travels to back and forth between Sweden and Denmark uh, because of work. So he had been controlled 150 times during the last year. So he had started to film every encounter. So it became like a discussion, identical, underlining the problem with some people, uh, especially uh, young men with uh, uh, racialized as non-white, uh, being stopped, stopped frequently by the police. And, and when we did this community survey with Volker Tsusby, um, I mean, this is a, 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 a yeah, I, I, I indicate, it was a small, uh, um, a small community survey uh, conducted together with the people, the inhabitants there. So we went out and we, we had like uh, 30 questions. And so, uh, and, and, and we, we, we developed the survey because I mean, as I, I indicated before, there's no, no, there, there is very few, very little knowledge about the problem, about with racism in, 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 in the Swedish society. So we asked, uh, uh, have you been stopped by the police during the last uh, 12 uh, months? And of the, the 715 persons who responded to our survey, uh, which is actually, a, I mean, a classic tactic by, by critical criminologists uh, working with communities. Uh, a technique. Uh, Forty-five percent said of the the respondents answered that they had been stopped uh, by the police, and especially was young uh, men. But also, as the numbers and unfortunately they are in Swedish, twenty-six percent of the women who, who responded the, the survey also said, "I've been stopped by the police the last." Uh, uh, so, in some places, in some neighborhoods in Sweden, to be stopped and, and controlled by the police is a very frequent uh, experience. And it, it happens, uh, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's become normalized in, in, in a sense, even though it's never normal because it's always an abuse and every abuse is, is, is special. So, and what's interesting with the survey that we did was that we also asked, okay, but we also tried to uh, 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 address the, the, the problem with, um, I mean, uh, who is stopped? Is it, is it randomly? And it's, of course, it's not randomly, but there's, there's a system, a racial system there. So, so we, uh, um, we divided the statistics on background. And what you see here in the bottom is, is uh, of, the, of the, those who had been stopped, 53.9, so 54% of the people had, uh, of those with background in, in, in in Africa and the Middle East. So more than about half of, the, of those who have been stopped had background in, in the Middle East or in Africa, in different parts of Africa. And then you see background in Asia and background in South or Central America, like myself, 
it's it's a, a smaller portion of the of those who have been stopped. So you see the like the right racial uh, hierarchy of police stops uh, on the, in this in this one, and in the last is background in in the in the north. Uh, and I want to stress that I mean these statistics that we have uh, uh, collected is not I mean you cannot generalize from this survey, but it's uh, indicative of of the situation in 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 uh, in Husby, of course, but also I would argue um, in other poor urban areas where populated by, I mean, the racialized working class in Sweden. So, so uh, my first point that I want to make is that, uh, I mean, we see, we have the problem with uh, 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 over controls. Uh, and I mean, if you read the literature, uh, from the US, uh, you see the problem with, uh, I mean, walking while black or driving while black, and you see the same type of stories or same type of uh, experiences being repeated by young people uh, in, in the, 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 the Swedish context. So, so, so uh, it, it is expressed in, in similar ways. But then, and this is a very important argument that I also want to stress, and I, uh, we, um, uh, and I raised my hand because I, I, I would like, it, I mean, understand that the, the role and the task of the pol police is to enforce the current order, the current racial order, the current uh, capitalist order, the caste order, whatever. I mean, in different contexts, it's, it's, it's the, the different um, groups who rule, but they want to, in different ways, use the police or the police is used to, to enforce the order. Uh, but. I mean, the idea with the police is that they should solve crime. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the uh, that's why we have them, or the, what that's why we should have them. Uh, and and so the second argument is about uh, racial problem profiling as a as a problem with underprotection. Uh, and uh, we in the community survey that we did of the seven hundred and fifteen respondents, fifty five percent knew somebody in their neighborhood who had lost their life in this lethal violence that we've seen in, 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 the, in the Yarva area. So, I mean, the, the whole community is, is, is uh, affected by uh, the, the high indices of, of lethal violence in, in the, the, the area. Uh, and the problem is that the police is not doing their job. They're not solving the, the, the violent crime. But they are uh, constantly stopping and harassing young people for, uh, for uh, minor offenses and, and most often not for any offense at all. So one of the, the, the men that I interviewed, he said the following. See, a month ago, there was a gunfire in Husby. Somebody had mixed up the car that my brother and his friends were sitting in and fired several shots at it. They were injured, but miraculously they survived. The ambulance didn't uh, dare to come until the police were on site. So when the police get there, everyone's, well, everyone's screaming, West the ambulance? The guys start to argue with the police. That's when the police grab hold of my brother and say, you're not going nowhere while he's bleeding from his face. There's a fuss and the police put uh, the guys in a car. Then the ambulance arrives only after they've been frisked uh, are they taken to the hospital. So, I mean, these guys are treated as criminals and not as people who have been injured in a, in a deadly, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a cross, in the crossfire. So there's a criminalization of people for being, uh, I mean, black or, or racialized and not as not as not white, uh, and and I think that uh, I mean uh, a, a very uh, a very uh, striking uh, difference between the situation in Sweden and the situation in, for example, Nigeria, as you were uh, as Rino was uh, discussing, is that. In Sweden, people trust the police, uh, and people trust the police to uh, uh, to provide security. So that's why it's a very important uh, anti-racist uh, task to highlight and indicate that the police are distributing security very differently across urban space and across uh, uh, different populations of, of the of the of the uh, population. Uh, so uh, they're not doing their job. So they're, they're repressing people and, and so, uh, what's actually their function. Um, so so I, this is my uh, last slide and then, then I will uh, try to open up for questions. Uh, um, so racial profiling is a very powerful ter terminology in the Swedish 
uh, in a Nordic context to address problems with the, with police repression, because uh, it's I mean Sweden is ha there's a very strong understanding of Sweden as a colorblind equal just society where there's no racism etc cetera, etc cetera, which is false and it's been false since the pr premise of the, the the construction of the nation state system uh, because it was grounded on this idea that everyone was white and everyone was, was Christian and and I mean the Roma weren't Christian and the the the, the Roma population were sterilized etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's been a, like a very and the Sami population in the north of Sweden also had had the same history and and then um, I mean the, the 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 Finns who are now regarded as as white in the in the 70s they were not regarded as white but regarded as I mean uh, as more like Eastern Europeans or whatever so I mean who Sweden was constructed as a very specific white homogeneous society uh, excluding a, 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 a producing uh, categories of, of inhabitants as, as the other. And, and who is the other has transformed over the years. Now it's not, uh, for example, the Finns, but uh, people, especially with African origin or background and from the Middle East. Um, uh, and, 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 and giving this history, uh, and especially the, 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 the problem in Sweden, that we don't have any language to discuss problems with racism because we, we don't see race. Uh, racial profiling is a, is a very powerful language. It provides a language to social, social just movements to uh, close in on matters of race and racism. Uh, so, uh, and it also, I mean, it's a way to challenge this criminalizing narrative about people with immigrant descent being uh, over, over uh, uh, of, of being, um, I mean, the bias focus on, on immigrant crime in, in the Swedish and Nordic and European context. So it's very important to address police repression uh, to, and uh, to advance a victimological perspective that acknowledge um, problems with state violence uh, and state sanctioned violence, of course, because these people uh, the, I mean, these these uh, tactics are, are are sanctioned by the state in in many regards. Uh, uh, and with that said, I mean, beyond the U.S. and and also the question is if it's beyond the the U.K. Um, my perspective and, and my work is, uh, and I I know that we as academics we need to say like this is all such a this is a new argument and this is a, so uh, innovative innovative. Uh, but my perspective is not new nor innovative. Uh, I actually work uh, within, uh, I mean, I'm very inspired by the work by, that is done by, by critical scholars in the US and also, I mean, in the UK, uh, in, in the McPherson, very famous McPherson report that, I mean, um, where it was stated that the police uh, in, in Britain had, uh, in the UK had problems with institutional racism. Uh, David Munir representing the black churches states that the experience of black people over the last 30 years have been that we have been over policed and to a large extent underprotected. And in, so we see the same uh, situation uh, at, that was identified uh, in the 90s in the UK uh, in, the, in the Swedish context at the moment. So, so rather than going beyond research from the US and the UK, I think it's important to, to draw from the critical parts of it uh, in order to be, and in, of course, in a strategic manner. So, uh, and with that said, uh, thanks so much. And um, I hope I, I, I manage within my, my time limit. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. That's really fantastic. I, mean, uh, I feel like the US is often seen as the, uh, the only side of police repression in Sweden, at least from my perspective in the UK and my experience is it's in some social democratic haven uh, with the no problems at all. Um, so I think your research is, is, is incredibly important, um, especially when you say about, um, you know, police, uh, there are many police shootings, there are many police deaths, but really profiling itself as a form of violence, um, I think that's a really important thing to put out. Um, and also because Sweden, it, it could potentially, if we do this um, idea of Sweden as uh, a more equal society, um, it could potentially go undermine, the, the, the prevalent police uh, violence could potentially undermine of our 
uh, concepts about the relation between policing and racial capitalism. But what you've shown is that that is also a stereotype that needs to be debunked with this massive uh, increase in inequality and uh, neoliberalism um, that is kind of the welfare state. So um, I think that's really important. So thanks so much. Um, I, there's a question from Heli in the chat, um, which is that during COVID, um, there was a noticeable, was a noticeable increase in stop and search and racial profiling. Um, Heli noted there was no lockdown. Um, so presumably we would expect little to no lux in ratios. And then we have a shin Vanessa as well. So um, it's a tough task, but if you keep it fairly, then we can get those more questions in so much. Sorry, you're on mute, Andrew. Sorry. I mean, this, uh, a, a different, I mean, I, I should have um, uh, said that in the presentation. I mean, in, if, in the US context and in the UK, if you go into government, I mean, uk.gov, you have the, the stats on how many the police stop. And, and uh, so you have a lot of documentation. Uh, and then the police, I don't know how you evaluate it from a, from, from a UK perspective, if it's good or bad or whatever. But I guess that that produces a different type of, of, of discussion at least. And you can show that during COVID, uh, there was a lot of people uh, uh, of, from the racialized community who were stopped because of these uh, laws that were introduced during the COVID. But we don't have that type of statistics in Sweden because we don't measure race or ethnicity or whatever, I mean, how, however we want to, to identify or, or define this, uh, this, this concept. Uh, so so uh, we can't say uh, um, what happened, uh, but I think it's very interesting that, um, uh, that the Swedish strategy uh, of, which was very mild compared to other places was in that sense, uh, less repressive because we didn't give all the powers to the police. The police hadn't uh, an important role in that, in that uh, context. So, uh, so uh, in, in different discussions, I, I, uh, with, with, uh, I think that's important to remember that the police were not the, the, the institution and force to uh, safeguard us from, from COVID uh, in Sweden. It was uh, uh, done in more, a more Foucauldian way with our we had to stay at home, et cetera, et cetera, if we had a call. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. I know Renew has to leave, so I just want to thank so much for Renew before I take the next question. Um, thanks for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your time. Um, yeah, hope we can operate again. So thank you. I know you might have to be sure. Um, yeah, that's super interesting, Andrew. But I remember we a similar thing in Norway where we, we visited a prison in Norway and we asked the authorities how many black prisoners are there here? And they were so offended by the question. They said, we mean, we, we don't keep, we don't know. Almost as if they, you know, they were very, they were out of this kind of like colorblind approach, which is just so alien um, to a lot of people in the UK, well, actually not a lot of people, but it's alien to me and it just seems so unhelpful um, and, and almost just to pretend like issues of inequality uh, don't exist. Uh, just by saying, well, I don't know, because we all treat people as equal citizens, uh, which is very, very, very uh, weird. Um, Vanessa, you had a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Leanne, for this, for this presentation, um, which I find really crucial and very interesting. Also, looking at um, racist policing in Europe, because I, I find it very interesting that the debates around racial profiling in many Western European countries and Northern European countries, as far as I, because I was a bit following the work also some of the colleagues have been doing in the Northern European countries that the debate like started around 12, around 2012, 2013. So I think that's very interesting. Although a lot of the movements were not really connected. I know you had NPAD and some of the movements that really brought also racial profiling um, to the agenda. And I think there is something interesting um, here to look at, particularly also with regard to contexts that do not measure um, race and don't really have racial ethnic uh, statistic or at least do not conduct them. I, I was wondering, um, so one question is maybe just to, to, to reformulate because I, I, do, I don't really think that it's a paradox um, 
that police is upholding the social, social order um, and thereby only, like you said, distribute security different, differently. I think that's the kind of differentiality of policing that is inherent to, to, its, to the institution of police or to policing as a, as a mode of control and criminalization, because also the question is, what do we understand um, when we think of crime, right? So also how biopolitics and necropolitics are, are always intervened in the kind of racial capitalist system. But that's more a remark. I think the question I have is, um, how do you, like, what are kind of calls from the racialized communities that are critical of racial profiling as well as racist death by police, which do happen in, in that context too? I'm asking this question because I, I think in the current conjuncture, when we look, for instance, when I work in the German and France context and also dealing with Switzerland, where these issues are like since at least 10 years, more and more debated. Um, and I think that's, that's where it is so important that we go beyond the kind of question of statistic, because we see from the US and the UK that doesn't really stop the violence of policing, right? So it's the question like what to do with statistics, who's in a way conducting the, the statistics and for what? And is that even a claim by movements? And the other question is because what I observed in the German context particularly with the struggles against racial profiling was a bit this kind of move. Why are we controlled? We are citizens, we've done nothing wrong, but this separates from the struggles of migrants who are pushed into illegalized economies and maybe have to sell drugs sometimes, right? That's the issue, for instance, at the Berlin Görlitzer Park. So I think the question of nationality here comes in also in terms of the of the claims and struggles yes. of movement. And I was wondering if you could talk about this more. Wow. So you have several very big questions. And I think that all are, uh, I mean, uh, amazing and very, I mean, thought provoking. Um, I mean, for me, uh, I, 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 I see myself as an activist scholar. So I, I want to produce knowledge that is, uh, can be used. And then we also have to publish in, in these theoretical magazines, et cetera. But so when we do this community survey, we produce the data. Why do we produce data? Because there's a need to say, oh, we have these facts about how many uh, people have been stopped Be because of the shortage of, of facts um, uh, from the state. The, 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 and, but of course, as you're in, uh, I mean, there have been voices, especially for Afro Swedes, uh, Afro, the Afro Swedish Forum for Justice, uh, who want to have uh, police data on based on race uh, on who they stop and search. Uh, from from the Roma population, uh, they are much more critical towards uh, that type of data because their uh, his, history within the Swedish. I mean, they don't want to be registered by this repressive state apparatus. So we have different viewpoints i would argue depending on the, the, the your history in the and your experience of this the swedish state uh, but that's absolutely a discussion and there's conflicting uh, uh, views i would say um, i think it's very i mean from my pers perspective uh, i would be very glad i think it's enough that the the, the i mean we produce all these uh, statistics about who commits crime in sweden based on uh, uh, origin, where your parents are born and where your and your grandmother, even I mean, now we're talking about the thir third generation of immigrants. So we or, or even your where your grandmother is born. So I mean, we that would be enough for me as a as an anti racist scholar. Um, but uh, to have that data, or uh, based on uh, on uh, where you live. I mean, how often are you stopped if you live in a rich uh, area or in a poor area? Because segregation is so, in the class segregation is so intertwined with the racial and ethnic segregation. So it's, it's a very complicated matter. Uh, and it, it has to do with your understanding of the state. Uh, is the state good? Do, do you trust the state? Or do you think that if the police would have uh, this type of, and uh, produce this type of, of, of uh, knowledge, uh, what would they do with it? And, uh, and I, it's linked to your second remark about, I mean, the, the conflict between those who are citizens and those who are non-citizens. Um, 
uh, because the, from the police perspective, it would be used in order to, I, for example, uh, find these illegal immigrants. Uh, and that's not a progressive project. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, within, I mean, this uh, uh, unjust world order that we live. So uh, it's, it's uh, really, I mean, we work on a very, I mean, the police is, is a repressive institution uh, and it's it's a complicated uh, matter, and I think we have to like navigate it within the, the, the uh, within the political conjuncture that we are. And from from where I stand, what I see is uh, that politically uh, it's getting worse in Sweden. With I mean, the police is is more and more openly racist. Uh, now we're talking about clans, for example. Uh, in, in, and a discourse imported from from the from Germany uh, about families who are linked together, and that's why we have criminality. Instead of talking about, and this this these are discourse produced by the police. So so um, so uh, yeah. So it's it's a very long uh, answer on on your two remarks. Uh, and then uh, yeah, and yes, we are uh, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry for for. for talking uh, so much. Uh, no need to apologize, Joe, but thank you so much for that uh, sure. discussion really between both of you. Um, I'd love for this, I really would love for this to continue. I know that everybody has really important uh, schedules and stuff. So like, uh, I want to keep talking till 8 p.m. Um, but I don't want to keep you all too, uh, too much longer. So unless anyone has any final questions or comments, um, no, yeah. No, no, no. Thank you, oh, for everybody. Good. Thank you for the question. Oh. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, yeah, I just, thank you. Let's, I just want... uh, let's let's keep connected. For sure. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I just um, want to thank you all so much uh, for joining, um, especially to our speakers for sharing uh, your time and your knowledge and your wisdom. Um, and thanks, Vanessa, for uh, your questions. Um, it basically got me out of having some good uh, questions from the chat. So it was a fantastic, constructive discussion. And um, I think you, you know, you're pointing out that um, these transnational solidarities do exist and uh, not hiding them. And I think this discussion, in its very small way, is proof of that. Um, especially, you know, show uh, you know you're, you're you're based here in the UK, um, a kind of building solidarity on the ground here whilst searching. Um, Probably in India, and you work with detention solidarity. So these transnational solidarities do exist. More broadly, I think it's really encouraging to see that um, all of you are activists. Um, you know, we hear about the academics, uh, just they all have the ideas, they don't care about making change in the world, all this stuff you always hear. Um, and all of you are kind of disproving that uh, every day. Um, and yeah, just thanks so much for such a rich and diverse discussion. I think we uh, successfully show that police oppression is not just the uh, US reality. <laughs> um, and it's given me a lot to uh, reflect on, um, you know, all, all concepts of race, of caste, racial capitalism, neoliberalism, the welfare state, they all have different contexts. Um, but that doesn't mean there are things you can draw together to build some kind of solidarity. Mm -hmm.